I'm going to talk this morning around um, better incorporation of drought risk and also climate change projections into uh, water resources planning and give some insight into both what we're doing at Anglian but also what we're doing as part of the work at Water Resources East and in some cases the, the sort of industry uh, more generally. So just by way of an introduction, um, as you're probably aware, water companies have a statutory duty to um, prepare and maintain water resource management plans. And, and in this, we have to look out at a minimum of 25 years into the future in terms of supply um, and demand. And, and naturally that includes um, climate change. Now in our WMP 19, which was published a couple of years ago now, um, we set out almost a billion pounds worth of investment over the five year period up to 2025. And of that, around 300 million was explicitly related to climate change adaptation. Water companies and indeed multi-sector stakeholders are now cooperating to produce uh, regional uh, multi-sector water resource plans. Uh, and these are being co-developed with WMP. So for example, in the East, Water Resources East are the grouping um, which is producing that plan. And there's five different um, groups around the country. And managing droughts and other climate risks is really an integral part of managing climate change overall and sits alongside the water industry's commitment to be carbon net zero uh, by 2030. So what does drought look like in Eastern England? This was a sort of retrospective analysis that, that we did looking back over the sort of 20th century into the first part of this century. And essentially there have been seven notable droughts over that period. Many of these uh, dates will be familiar to those of you who, who track droughts. Um, interestingly for us in the East, 75, 76 wasn't um, the, the most significant drought. Um, the groundwater drought, as we call it, of 1990, 1992 um, was very significant. And some of the droughts um, going back into the 1920s and 1930s remain um, our reference droughts for some parts of our system. And in particular, we're vulnerable to successive dry winters in the east. Um, generally, we're lucky to have um, big um, storage, both surface storage, reservoirs like uh, Rutland, which is in the image behind me, um, but also um, a lot of groundwater, which is generally fairly slowly responding. So as well as this analysis in the run-up to WMP19, we also looked at producing what we call drought narratives. And these are really chronological um, you know, descriptions um, of the meteorology that caused sustained and terminated um, droughts. And we initially focus on historical droughts, and you can see some of the, some of the data that we analyzed on the, on the right-hand side. Um, but we also looked at creating these narratives for stochastic droughts, which are essentially synthetic droughts that, that we uh, created um, using some techniques, which I'll talk about later, to look at alternatives to what actually um, happened in history. And we were able to link those to some of the potential driving atmospheric variables, um, things like NAO, but also things like um, sea surface uh, temperature, and to relate them to sort of simple um, weather types. Now, when we get into modeling climate impacts for water resources planning, we really have a sort of cascade, a chain, if you like, of, of approaches. So we start with the climate data. We run through different um, hydrological models. We then do system modeling, this is sort of modeling of the water resources system um, using bespoke or proprietary uh, models. And then finally, we move into uh, an investment uh, modeling phase. And this is generally um, fairly linear, but more recently, as, as you'll see later, we've been looking at how we can actually um, alter our, our approach to investment modeling and indeed system modeling to account for the range of uncertainty that we get um, as we go through the chain. And really we've seen an evolving um, approach, both to drought, uh, which we've got on this slide and climate change on the next slide, really a maturing of the approach to analyzing drought risk um, as we've gone through successive water resource management plans. So the, the initial focus, if you're looking back 15 years ago or so, was really, well, we, we would do that, we would be resilient to the worst drought on record. And, and to do that, we would extend the historical record back, back in time. Um, and as we've gone on, we've more recently been ad adapting to um, specific and higher levels of resilience standards. So at the moment, we're aiming to be resilient to a one in 200 year standard, which essentially means that we wouldn't impose the most severe restrictions and a lesser drought was more severe than, than that. And in order to do that, we've had to look um, both at the um, sort of extreme value analysis of historical events, 
but we've also had to look at um, alternative techniques. So in particular, using stochastic weather generators to look at alternatives, but also um, looking at drought narratives and more recently looking at storylines as an alternative approach, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. And similarly on the climate side of things, um, you know, we started off just really using simple delta change factors, um, but as successive um, iterations of UK climate projections have been published, we've, we've picked up and, and worked with that. So largely focused on spatially coherent projections, um, but now also extending that um, to look at integration with weather generators and using more advanced bias correction techniques. And if you look at the academic literature, this is some work that um, my, one of my PhD researchers at, at, this, in, at Reading University, Wilson Chan, has been looking at the um, sort of literature that's been published um, on climate impacts on flows um, over the past couple of decades. And in this, you can really see an evolution from the sort of more stylized literature, the more sort of um, simplistic characterization of climate projections, which really kicked things off in the 1990s through to adoption of GCM driven um, approaches. And then with publication of UK uh, CP09 and, and more recently 18, adoption of probabilistic approaches. But alongside that, we've also seen these more scenario neutral approaches, which really focus on things like system sensitivity and actually hark back to some of the more simplistic approaches that we were using a couple of decades ago. And more recently, and this is sort of getting into the sort of more uh, sophisticated um, approaches, we've been doing some work with the Met Office, um, with Joe Osborne and, and uh, Laura Dawkins and team um, to look at an alternative uh, weather generator. And this was being developed after looking at some different possible structures and the possible use of depraces, the reanalysis um, system. And really our specific needs here was that we wanted a model that would provide a daily resolution so we could use it in our uh, rainfall runoff models, in our recharge models. We need it to be able to capture long duration droughts, which as I say is a key feature for us in the East. And these models need to be coherent in time and space. Um, and really that picks up on some of the um, issues that we have with aspects of things like um, UK CP18. So that what the Met Office have, have come up with is a very innovative uh, modeling framework. Um, for those of you who are into these things, it's a three state hidden Markov model. Um, and we have a copular model, a separate copular model for spatial dependency um, between sites. Um, and this model um, essentially fits three different distributions to different uh, states of rainfall, depending on whether it's dry, wet, um, or very wet. Um, and that gives us a, a really good fit overall. We've also interpolated this to um, high resolution grid. So the HAG UK um, products, which the Met Office are, are now using, um, particularly useful in this regard. And indeed it's that model which um, MOTS have used um, um, to calibrate the rainfall runoff models, which I'll talk about shortly. We've done a lot of work on validation, um, really important when we're using these um, techniques and we've got accurate capture of, of rainfall occurrence, occurrence intensity, as well as the long duration drought um, behavior. And a critical factor here is that there's no need for any kind of additional bias correction, unlike um, we've had to do you know, with using uh, previous weather generators. Now, if we look at climate change projections, this is some plots that um, another of my uh, PhD researchers, Neil A. Rainiers at UEA um, has produced. Um, you can really see the, the changing level of aridity in this case, um, as we move um, to two degrees and potentially a four degrees uh, world. And these um, projections um, um, are based on the different ensemble members. So you've got um, these are from the UK CP18 spatially coherent projections. So you can see that there's some differences here in the interpretation um, of these different uh, models, um, but a clear um, drying trend as we go to, to two and particularly four degrees, uh, particularly in, in Southeast England. And if you look at the sort of possible evolution, this is just looking, um, these plots in the middle here, are just looking at um, one um, ensemble member um, and you can really see that, that the, the, the sort of ex expectation that droughts will increase um, in future. Um, so the top plot's just looking at SPI, the second is in, including um, evaporation. Um, and you can see that we're getting um, increased frequency of droughts 
uh, going into the future in this ensemble member. Um, those droughts are more likely to be uh, widespread and they're likely to be um, multi-year droughts. And you can also see a really big difference between um, SPI, which is just based on precipitation, and SPI, which is say includes um, evaporation. So obviously that's just based on, on PT uh, rather than AT, but it gives an indication of the potential influence of temperature as we move into the future. And again, if you look at the severity of extreme droughts, it's another plot from um, Nile. Um, this really quite clearly shows that uh, we get some um, more severe droughts um, in future. This is looking at the severity of droughts. So it's the sum of the, um, if you like, the um, severity over the course of the, of the drought. And particularly for um, the south um, of England, you see again, as we move towards two and then four degrees, that we're seeing uh, more significant droughts. And that's really accentuated um, when we take into account um, uh, temperature and PET. So there's been a few studies already published looking at uh, UK CP18 and the implications for water resources planning. Some of the headline messages are included here. So there's a lot of similarities um, with UK CP18 and UK CP09. Um, but uh, larger uncertainties. The SCPs, the spatial coherent projections, uh, have a particular um, outcome in terms of dry autumns, which obviously has, has big implications for, for recharge. Um, essentially, larger deficits um, um, are projected um, under climate change scenarios um, and from increasing the level of drought resilience to protect to so the one in 500 year drought resilience standard, which is now what we're, what we're moving towards. Uh, and there's some other projects, including the EFLAG um, project, which are due to um, publish shortly. If we then look at the sort of rainfall runoff and the hydrological modeling side of things, um, we've spent a lot of um, effort and time working with um, our consultant, Mark McDonald, um, on producing a new set um, of, of, of rainfall runoff models. And, and the kind of ask here is that they've got to be, they've got to be high performing. Um, they've got to be efficient because we need to we need to put a lot of data through there, not just the historic data, but also a lot of stochastic um, weather data. And then you can kind of multiply that up by looking at climate change projections. So MOTS basically reviewed the performance of a whole host of different rainfall runoff models. Uh, GR6J was the strongest uh, calibration and validation looking at a range of performance metrics. Um, and we particularly found that the additional two parameters compared to the GR4J model, which has also been used um, extensively in the UK and elsewhere, made a significant difference in low flow calibration, which is particularly important for us in the east of England. And these models, you can see there's a number of different models that have been produced on in the map on the right hand side. They've been coded in Python um, and very much sit within our kind of portfolio of, of system modeling. Well, on the groundwater side, the kind of the innovation here really has been to work um, using lump parameter models. And we've developed these for four regional groundwater models to provide um, a simplified representation, particularly around um, base flow. And these are driven, um, these are driven by recharge models using SWACMOD, um, which has been produced by Alistair Black and colleagues. Um, and then the LPMs have been calibrated to the regional groundwater models um, to provide naturalized storage and base flow at the sub catchment level. So within, within the kind of blocks that have been presented on, on the right hand side. The LPMs are also coded in Python. And again, we're able to run those um, very efficiently. And in fact, we've included the LPMs as part of our um, regional simulator. So moving on to look at system simulation briefly. Um, we've again um, invested quite significantly, um, particularly in, with, through Water Resources East, um, in developing um, a system simulator that can cope with not just um, public water supply, demand and supply, but actually looking at including agriculture, energy, and more explicit representation of environmental needs. And this has been developed in something called PyWR, which is an open sourced um, generalized network model um, written by uh, James Tomlinson and Josh Arnott um, and more recently has been developed further um, with the with Atkins and the, and the University of Manchester's group led by Julian Haru um, and this is it, this takes inputs of flow um, recharge demand and importantly different options that we can use to solve supply demand balance and as I mentioned it includes those lump parameter groundwater models and essentially we couple um, this system simulator with um, a search algorithm. 
Um, and that enables us to look at the trade-offs between different portfolios um, in, in the future. So if we want to um, look at the performance of, a, of an option, um, whether it's to do with resilience, cost, its, its ability to supply agriculture or, or energy, um, often what we see is there's trade-offs in, in those objectives. Um, and we use um, a, an explicit web-based kind of trade-off tool, which is illustrated in the bottom right here, to look at those trade-offs um, and identify kind of preferences from a stakeholder point of view in terms of um, identifying a way forward. The other thing that we've been looking at more recently is storylines and, and Wilson Chan um, at the University of Reading working with us um, has been looking at a, a really a, a different kind of conceptual approach, um, of, often asking kind of what if type of question. So what if um, we, we have three dry winters, which is to say we're particularly susceptible to. So recently Wilson's been looking at um, the repetition to adding a, adding a dry year before or after the 2010-12 drought, which is obviously one of our, our most recent droughts. Um, and essentially this shows that the fast responding catchments in the sort of, the, in the, in the sort of west and north um, of the UK are more susceptible to this, this dry year before. Um, but in the east, um, we then quantified how worse the drought would be for small, slow responding catchments. So the catchments we might see that are underpinned by groundwater if the, if the dry um, conditions um, persisted. Um, and this is really useful in, in looking at that kind of that what if situation. So you can see you know, the, the impact um, that uh, could have happened if that, um, if that conditions you know, hadn't returned. Um, to normal and of course we actually ended up with an incredibly wet summer if you remember back in, in 2012 which dramatically terminated the drought. And we've also used the same technique to look at the comparison with uh, with past droughts this again focuses um, on the on the east of England um, and essentially we've been looking at different kind of counterfactual uh, storylines so looking at dry year before and dry year after again but also looking at the driest precondition and then also looking at climate change so in this case a two degree um, warming. Um, and here we were able to show that the, um, the, the sort of the, the counterfactual storylines, um, we, we essentially saw um, more severe drought only when we moved to the, um, the longer term, the two year plus um, droughts. Um, and then when we looked at the three dry winter storylines, these show that they didn't actually exceed the, the, the long groundwater drought that, as I mentioned earlier, we had in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. But if, if we add in climate change, then we would expect to um, we would expect to see that. So again, it's an, an important kind of um, context, a sort of analog type context to look at the implications. So just sort of rounding up uh, with some with some conclusions. Um, essentially, I've given you kind of a very rapid kind of talk through of some of the sort of techniques that we're adopting as we mature the approach to, to drought risk and climate change um, assessments and. This is really now informed by what I've described as a multi-method approach. So we're not using any kind of single method, but we're combining insights from analysis of, of, of longer term historical data, from stochastic weather generation, climate projections and storylines. And as part of this, high performing, efficient hydrological models are essential. And it's something that we've invested in quite substantially over the last few years. Huge uncertainties remain, um, including the influence of temperature, as I mentioned, the changing intensity of rainfall, which is something that we're observing, but um, we've not directly looked at within our modeling yet, and also water quality impacts. And hydrological model uncertainties um, are also important. And the final point is that our decision-making techniques are now explicitly incorporating uncertainty, and ultimately we're seeking robust outcomes um, that will allow us to move forward um, with adaptation measures um, but recognising the uncertainty that, that will inevitably exist. Thank you very much, Jeff, for, for that. Um, there have been a couple of comments, no, no specific questions, but can I just ask, ask you one quickly, and that is, what do you think are the main areas for development for the, for, for the next planning cycle? Fairly briefly, please. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good one. I mean, I think, I think as picking up on some of those sort of areas of, un, of, of additional uncertainty is probably where I think we need to go to. I mean, the the Im impact of changing rainfall patterns. So we're seeing you know increasingly intense rainfall. Um, that has a particular implication on the sort of amount of recharge that we're seeing, but also the uh, the water quality implications from that as we see kind of flush events um, during the autumn. So I think those things need to be need to be picked up. 
And, and just one more, which has just been posted about the risk of major impacts looks large, yet public awareness of water stress in the country is low. How how should this uh, be be addressed, or how is it being addressed? Yeah, I think I mean I think the, I think it's right in terms of the the, the public interest in terms of around sort of personal water consumption um, is 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 potentially low, and that's definitely a challenge. I think where we've actually seen a lot of public engagement over the past 12, 24 months has actually been around the environmental impacts um, of abstraction um, things on things like chalk streams and also discharges into those environments. And so I think bringing what we need to do now is bring that kind of back full circle, um, you know, because we're all we're all part of that, if you like, that kind of hydro social cycle. Um, so we need to kind of situate ourselves within that and understand what, what we can all do to improve that situation.